What's up, everyone? We're coming to you not from Zoom or Wintrust Arena or the SunTimes office. Nope, we're recording this live from the iconic Wiener Circle and our first live episode. Who better to have than championship winning head coach and GM, James Wade. James, it's the night before the season opener. Yeah your title defending season and you're here with us. So first I just have to say thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, so happy to have you here. Um, my second question though, since you're here, does that mean we're good on the breaking news or should I keep my phone? I guess we're good should I keep my news. phone, the notifications on? Is Kelly gonna <laughs> give me she's any gonna, updates? She's gonna see right now we're good. You know, we've uh, solidified our roster. Uh, of course we're having, you know, a couple of, a few hardships uh, to play tomorrow. Right. Uh, they still have to clear waivers for us to actually sign them. But uh, for the season, our 11 player roster is pretty much set. Right. Um, I'm glad you brought this up right now because let's just get right into that because I okay. think for a lot of fans, it gets a bit confusing with the hardship contracts, the, the, uh, yeah, it, it just gets a bit confusing. And so you have four players that you're expecting to sign to replacement contracts tomorrow. Yeah. Can you explain a bit um, for, for our listeners and for, for fans that don't have that full understanding of, of what it is when you need to apply for a hardship exception? So you apply for the hardship exception when you have injuries um, or when you have players that report late from uh, overseas duties uh, as, as far as playing basketball. Or, right or other things if they're not in market. And the players that you have in training camp, you actually, if you want to bring them in as replacements, you have to waive them. Like you have to waive them and they have to be on waivers uh, because you don't want to deny them an opportunity to play at another uh, ball club. And so uh, when you bring them in as a hardship, you know, it's because they don't, they've exhausted every other option of playing a, uh, under a year, under a yearly contract. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, with that said, you know, because we have players that's going to be late, that's what we have to apply for uh, because we only have six players tomorrow that will be on our 11-player roster. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, the challenge in the WNBA yeah, is real. Yeah, but we're happy to have those six here, and we have one player that's heading back tomorrow that will be here tomorrow but won't be, you know, won't be back in time for the game. Then we'll have a few more filtering in as the, as the, as the time passes in May, so – we should be whole pretty soon, but uh, not 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 too soon. You know? Not yet. Yeah. And when you're asked about this, you often talk about like this isn't a problem that just the sky are facing. This is every every team in the WNBA is is facing challenges like this. So can you describe how this challenge is indicative of the expansion that's necessary in the league and also on rosters? I mean, wow, we were watching, you know, all the players that were getting like waved and it was like real WNBA players. We're right. Like, wow. They're getting and so we have this board in our offices with all the players and you're taking names from a team and putting it under the free agency. And you have so many players that you can actually have two teams uh, of good players. Right. So and, you know, and general managers, we have to be very creative as far as what we're doing with the salary cap and stuff like that. So uh, it doesn't come without its challenges, but I think Kurt Miller said it uh, pretty well. Sometimes it doesn't match. Like you can have one player, but uh, it doesn't match with another player's uh, the amount of money that they're making. And so you can't have them both together. And so it's about having the best 11 players together. And that's a challenge, but you know, that's, you know, that's why they play us the small books. You know, I had somebody tweet me yesterday about, do these, do these people just not know how to manage the salaries or, or manage their rosters? I'm like, no, it's quite the opposite. They actually are juggling these salaries and fitting it together, these puzzle pieces quite yeah. brilliantly. But, you know, this podcast originally started because I was having all of these profound conversations with people like yourself, players who's life experience was a daily education you know like i'm leaving conversations with you guys and i'm like okay i could apply this to my life and it felt almost like unfair that i was getting these conversations and then you know using one small quote of yours or one small quote of vandersloots it's it just wasn't fair so i really do love 
getting beyond sports on this podcast and your career is is really something that I think so many can learn from. You've talked a lot about how your expectations for yourself when you are a player, you know, contributed to your mentality shifting as a coach to to not having expectations. So let's take it back Ooh. all the way to the beginning. What inspired your career in coaching? Um, I guess it was by chance. You spend all your life like in love with a sport, in love with the game, and you know, giving so much of yourself to it um, that you never wanted to end. Mm -hmm. And so, I think the best way to do that is by sharing that love with other people mm -hmm. and helping them to express their love for the game. And so, um, and you know, actually celebrating their their, their love with them. Uh, and seeing them succeed. And so that's what I was able to do in coaching, um, actually empowering players and getting them to places that they probably didn't feel like they could go. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and just hoping that, or wishing that I had someone like that, mm -hmm. you know? And if I can be that for them, uh, then, you know, it'll make the sport even better. So that's, that's where it came from. Uh, never, you know, I've always, you know, on my tombstone, I wanted to be known as this great player, you know? <laughs> so, uh, but it didn't work out that way. And and uh, I I didn't realize until I started coaching that my fulfillment, uh, it, it was much more full in, from coaching than it was from playing. I mean, you had a, a professional career yeah. playing. Yeah. You played overseas. I wasn't Chris You always Paul, talk though. about yourself like you're a chump, but you had a professional <laughs> career. Yeah, but you know, that's, it's and I'm always appreciative of every you know step that I've made, uh, but like I told you, I had high expectations for myself that I didn't meet, and so that's why I never do the same as a coach, and I you know I will I will never do it. So. Well, this is another story that I've heard about your transition from playing to coaching from yourself and, and from okay. others about uh, that jump to joining Dan Hughes staff in, in San Antonio. And I recently heard a new a new iteration of it. Um, Olaf told me a story about <laughs> if you read the special edition, you already know about the story. But Olaf told me a story about, you know, the first time he met you and, yeah. and Edvige. Yeah. Edvige is James's wife, for those who don't know, a silver medalist. She's. She's the goat of the family, in yeah, my humble opinion. Um, but she, you, you come to to the stars practice, and she introduces you to Olaf, and and he, she she says, "Can you put him through a workout?" Yeah. So what what happened next? So I didn't know Olaf, mm -hmm. but I knew Sandy a little bit. Yeah, and I talked to her a little bit, and they were telling me, and I was playing overseas at the time, and mm -hmm. I was at home on vacation doing the during the summertime and the beach was playing. And um, so Sandy was standing up, we had this balcony with the track over the top and St Sandy was standing down watching. I was like, I'm gonna play a trick on Olaf. <laughs> and the beach told him like, could you work my, you know, she asked him if, if you know, if you can work my husband out, he's, you know, he, he has a little kink in his shot, you know? Yeah. And uh, Olaf was like, sure, you know, that's what I do. Okay, bring him to practice. I, <laughs> I got to practice. And so I told him, I was like, yeah, I got this. I got this hitch in my shot. I don't know, you know, I just need to fix it, you know, whatever. And he was like, how long have you been playing professionally? I was like, for like eight years. He was like, okay, uh, let's, you know, he gave me the ball. And then I shot the ball like this. <laughs> <laughs> and so I looked at him and Sandy was looking at and his eyes was like, and he's a nice guy. Right. And so he doesn't want to, you know, it's, it was like, he was like, oh. My Even God. when he told me the story, he was like so kind about it. He was like, yeah, he did this thing. And, and it was just the weirdest shot he I'd ever seen in my life. Like he wasn't even like, what the F? Like so, he didn't, it was just like. And so he turned his head and we all just died laughing and he didn't know what was going on. And then he saw that we were joking and he was like, oh my gosh, he just turned red. It, yeah. was, it was amazing. It was amazing. That was a moment that we shared. And that's, I think that's the thing where we kind of like bonded from there. So it was pretty cool. Yeah. And another thing that often gets brought up when people are talking about you, both colleagues and, and players that you've coached is just your ability to connect with, with people on a human level. And so that's, that's a skill and it's a hard skill. We're not all good at, at connecting yeah. with, with new people in that way. And so I wonder for you how that skill really got honed and, and have you always just been somebody who's been able to establish these relationships like that? I, I mean, I don't know. Uh, 
I guess I think you got to care about people. Yeah, I guess, you know, um, and I, I, I want to see everybody happy. So uh, you just try to connect with them. And I know a, a lot of times people just want to be heard. Mm -hmm. And so I try my best to listen. Uh, you got two ears and one mouth for a reason. So <laughs> I try to use it. I got I try to use it and, and just make sure that I'm just connecting with people. The first thing I do when I arrive in practice is I make sure I look at everybody in the eyes and uh, ask them how they're doing and just make, you know, no distant waves or anything like that. I have to actually go to them and just see them uh, and make sure they're OK. Connection is important. Very. So in the last five years, these last five years for you have been, I mean, significant from an outsider's perspective. I'm going to let you you use whatever words you want to use to describe it. Pretty but cool. yeah, in the last five years, you won a championship on the Lynx staff yeah. as an assistant yeah. um, on Cheryl Reeves' staff. Right. You worked closely with Syl. Um, yeah. She won MVP that year. Right. You were named head coach of the Sky, head coach and GM of the Sky. Mm -hmm. You won coach of the year in your first year. And then you bring the Chicago Sky its first ever championship. <laughs> Help, help, help bring it, because coach <laughs> players, it's, it's a group effort. And it wasn't just history for the Sky. Um, it was history in Chicago, Chicago's first WNBA championship. Like, this is all very significant stuff. Yeah. So try not to downplay it with your answer. But what have the last five years been like for you, that journey? And can you explain how your lifetime of work set you up for these moments, not just, you know, one thing after the other. It was it was the lifetime of work that prepared you for all of it. It's, it's been pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, I mean, uh, it's been cool. I, I mean, I don't know how to, I guess because I'm in the middle of it still, I, I don't yeah. know, but um, I think once you, um, you have all these, like you try so hard all your life to just accomplish things mm -hmm. and sometimes you fail and um, you have to take something from it. And so instead of wallowing in it, I always try to learn from it. And I, I, I take that failure with a certain pride and I don't forget it so I can build on it. Mm -hmm. And so when big moments come, I'm not afraid of them. Mm -hmm. And I just try to attack them as much as I can. And I look for the difficult moments uh, because coming out of them is probably the most um, rejoiceful thing that you can actually experience. Man, I think we could all relate to that yeah, coming out of the challenge. Regular life. It's, that's, re it's regular life, that's right? The, yeah. That's the best part of life. I think you're right, is coming out of yeah. the challenge, making it to the other side of that. And something that I'm not sure a ton of people know, it's, it was surprising when I heard, was you almost joined the sky before joining the Lynx staff in 2017. And <laughs> yeah. the entire story is just so like, it's such a great example of, of the right timing in life. Yeah. And so take us back to that that year, 2017. Amber Stocks, you know, yeah. offered you an assistant position on her staff. And in in the final moments, you you talk to Cheryl and, and get an offer there. And and why was that right? Why why was that the right decision for you? So um up until that point, I was with Dan Hughes in, in 2000 to 2016, mm -hmm. and he retired. And when he retired, my contract wasn't renewed. And um, so I was like looking for a job mm -hmm. and in the WNBA. And I fig and that's when I like I didn't have any expectations. So I was like, I'm probably going to coach in high school <laughs> in France and I'm I'm cool. Like it was a nice run, you know. <laughs> it was a good run, you know. Decent. I like I love, you know, working with Dan Hughes, but it was too good to be true. So, you know, nothing's gonna happen. And then I got a, a call from one team and then another team and you know, but I was for a month, I was like I didn't know what I was gonna do. Mm -hmm. I had a newborn baby and um just, you know. I didn't shout know out to Jet. Yeah, shout out to Jet. <laughs> He's not so newborn right now. And um, we didn't know what we were going to do. And um, then, you know, a couple of coaches called. And so this is why me and Sandy Brandello are, are so close. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of respect for um, Dan was retired and Sandy was coaching in Phoenix and she didn't have any spots on her staff. Mm -hmm. But both of both of those coaches, they called other coaches in the league. And they were just calling saying, uh, man, he's a nice guy. And 
I didn't know like what my son, like I, I was just trying to provide for my son. Mm -hmm. And so that was like a tough moment for me. Um, I still remember it was a real tough moment for me. And then all of a sudden coaches start calling and Amber got the job and she called and I was so appreciative of her. Mm -hmm. Like I was, I was really appreciative of her giving, just giving me an opportunity to be back in the league. And so, um, after that, um, Cheryl called me, but she called me on the wrong phone. <laughs> <laughs> and and Amber, like, I was, like, so close. I was like, yeah, just give me the weekend. Yeah. And Dan called me and was like, hey, Cheryl's been trying to call you. And and so I checked another phone because I live everywhere and I have so many phones. Uh -huh. I checked another phone and it was like Cheryl on the line saying, hey, you know, how would you like to be a part of the Lynx? And. I'm like, she, her voicemail was yeah, just a straight yeah, up job offer. Yeah, just, yeah, like, Mic how, drop. How would you like, you know, like, how would you like to be a part of the links? And I was like, get the out of here, man. Like, sure. Like, we just came off. I was on the worst team in the league. And I'm going, you know, would be have the opportunity to go to, like, to Minnesota. And um, so I called her back and she was like, you need to come. We want to, you know, bring, fly you in and mm -hmm. interview you here. And so I, and, it was the weekend that I was supposed to give Amber her response. Uh -huh. And I was like, give me a couple of days. And she was like, okay. And so I saw everything they had to offer. And she said, the one thing that we're going to allow you to be yourself. And, you know, you, you, you're you going to, we're going to challenge you to be a winner. Mm -hmm. And so uh, once that opportunity came and I'm like, okay, I'm going to coach for something, not to just be coaching. So mm -hmm. we're coaching to win. And she challenged me from that day. And, um, you know, I accepted the challenge and, you know, the rest is history. The rest is history. All right. So a significant takeaway from that is just the importance of giving yourself time to make an important decision. Yeah. So what advice do you have in that regard about the importance of taking a beat, taking a breath before jumping into that next big opportunity? Um, you know, I think it was circumstance like this was kind of led. <laughs> you know, this like I, I I'm not gonna say like I mastered that, like, yeah, I took my like nah, if she wouldn't have called, I would have been in Chicago mm -hmm. like two years earlier. Okay, okay. And so um and just that was the first time I think in my coaching career that I had the opportunity to make a decision. Mm -hmm. Like it was the first time I was a free agent and the first time I actually had multiple offers on the table. And so um it served me well to, you know, actually sit down with my family and kind of uh, see what situation best fitted, you know, not just me, but my family. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was the first time because my son was a newborn that I was making the decision for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so that was interesting in itself. It's like me and my wife, us together, we can just go anywhere and do anything. But and when it came to his well-being, it's like, where would he fit, fit in? How could, you know, where would we live, do all this stuff? And, uh, so I felt like a grown up for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> for the first time. So another moment of divine timing in the sky's history that I just really blew my mind when I heard this story was that Courtney Vandersloot could have gone to the stars in 2011 had had Pokey Chapman not been the coach, not known she was going to draft her with the third pick. Right. Dan was set on on selecting her with the sixth overall pick yeah. in the 2011 draft. And have you ever had a conversation with her about like the fact that you guys could have met up all those years earlier? Or has that ever come up between the two of you? Yeah, I mean, we, we've had our run-ins like all the time. And I knew about this story <laughs> with D-Rob because he took D-Rob right. the sixth pick instead of because Sloot wasn't on the board. And uh, we've met like at different places in our lives, like in Spain, in a, in a bar where I was DJing. She'll tell you about that story. You weren't actually DJing. I was DJing in the bar. I was, that wasn't my Wait, job. Wait, hand to the Bible, you were DJing in the bar. I was DJing that night, but it wasn't my job. What was the bar in Spain? I, I gotta do my job and I fact check. I forgot the name of the bar, but <laughs> we were all like, I was there to like look at uh, Team USA. Uh -huh. And I was there, like going to see Candace and a couple other players that I knew, Sue, and um, and so the they were playing horrible music, and I was like, "Let me DJ." Let me up here. Yeah, and so he let me DJ, and so I was DJing for a little bit, and I was playing like the same twelve songs, but they were really good. <laughs> what was one of them? Uh, I don't know. Like maybe Notorious B.I.G. was one of them. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and then we DJ for a while, and. 
until Sue Bird broke the turntable and <laughs> they kicked us out. <laughs> so do you believe in divine timing then of like, there are certain people in your life that, yeah, you're really meant to, yeah. to cross paths with? Yeah, I think so. I, 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 feel, I really feel that way. Um, you know, I cross paths with Allie and all these, you know, wonderful people and Emma. That's one of the reasons why Emma's here. I was the first coach to go scout her mm -hmm. when she was 19 years old. And so we've had a relationship since then. And so I, I really believe in that. Candace, I've known her for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and I have, so, I have so many different connections with so many players mm -hmm. here. And just going back to that, Stu, I was the coach that's like really pulled for her when we drafted her in San Antonio. So. Um, and never would have thought like back then when we were on that losing team that we'll be winning the championship together. So, um, no, I, I believe in divine timing, um, and it's worked out so far. So it's worked out. Yeah. A little bit. A little bit. Yeah. So you brought them up, Sloot, Ali, Emma, and these were three stars in free agency. And mm -hmm. I'm just speaking for myself, but this free agency period was wild it was entertaining for i mean from a reporter standpoint like i was not for bored you. For you. <laughs> i wasn't sleeping much and i wasn't bored so your mission going in was to re-sign the core that's what you said from right. from the very beginning yeah. and then you go out and get 2019 wmb nba finals mvp emma misaman right. you sign julie aleman and you also bring in ann waters so before free agency begins, like how are you prepping yourself? How are you mentally getting yourself ready for this, like uh, just the intensity that's about to take place? You already know what moves you're gonna make. You already know what, what you're trying to do going in, obviously. A lot of cucumbers, bubble baths. <laughs> Self-care. <laughs> no, um, it, it's just a strategy. Yeah. And it doesn't always work. Right. And. So you have to have like your plan A's, your plan B's and plan C's. And so we went into it and we tried to strategize. And at the at the same time, you know that you're probably gonna lose some of your staff because your staff are such great people. Right. And, and so you have to like strategize and try to figure out what you're doing on that front and then what you're doing on the player front and calls that you make in December mm -hmm. uh, to teams. Uh, they have no interest. And, it, and it, the pot gets a little warmer by January and they start to have interest because even when it came to Julie, like it was no interest there early to, to get her mm -hmm. uh, when we called the team early on. And, um, you know, it, it, it changed over time. Um, you know, Anne was somebody that I was trying to get even before um, the Emma, you know, availability came along because right. I know it seems like it matches and it, and it does to some point, but um, Anne is someone that I've known for 20 something years and uh, Olaf really meant a lot to, you know, our organization, but mm -hmm. I wanted somebody to fill that void that I, I trusted um, could, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, and I, and so that meant that I, it would probably have to be someone that I had a prior relationship with that I trusted from a basketball mind standpoint. And that so so happened to be Ann Waters. Um, Emma is, you know, I, I saw the opportunity. We saw the opportunity and we kind of studied that. And so what, what general managers do is we study rosters, like, and we know the rosters, like, to, you know, and the salary cap. Right. And so we knew that uh, them having the number one pick, they were going to have some tough decisions to make. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having players that, you know, were coming back and then, you know, we knew that even with Tina Charles, if she came back or not, that, you know, it was going to be a tough decision for, for Washington to make. And um, so we just decided to put the pedal to the metal and, and just show her how we can be a beneficial team to her. Mm -hmm. um, uh, then what, what that does is we knew that we had seven free agents mm -hmm. um, and or eight free agents and seven free agents, sorry, and free agency that we had to sign. And that was just so tough <laughs> because you're like, Okay, which direction are we going? Right. Um, and so uh, that was, you know, you weigh the pros versus the cons, but we knew, uh, we studied our roster. We knew, you know, what direction we had to go in when it came to uh, people that we were going to keep. And our core was very important, especially to that championship run. And the way they played together uh, was amazing. Uh, and 
I mean, the the lineup combination of the starting five that we had, it, it wasn't even close. I mean, um, you guys enjoyed it. It was an enjoyable run. It was run. nice, right? It was nice. <laughs> well, like, that's what we do. We, we study these numbers sometimes. We lean on the eye test, but we study the numbers sometimes where we saw that they were like a plus 20, the, the starting five, and it was like, okay, whatever we do, we have to bring them back. Uh-huh. And, um, and, and, you know, I just wanted to – bring the players in that was going to compliment Candace and compliment Z and and uh we knew that was salute Allen and Kai mm-hmm. and uh we thought that Emma would do a great job of, of that also and and um like now we have we I think we have a a, a great complimentary team now it's just about you know putting it together and I, I was like <laughs> if I could be the weak link for this team then I think we'll be okay right. so I'm the weak link I think <laughs> Good on paper is what what you Good said said to me Good yesterday and and yeah. tomorrow it's it's got to show up. But show up. before we get into what is about to be your guys' title defending season, we got to go back for a minute. You talked about your connection to Sandy Rondello yeah. and your friendship with her. Obviously, your friendship and and working together with Olaf and it's just reflective of the small pond that the WNBA is in the sense of everybody is so connected. Right. Like you're, you're all, you've either worked together, you know each other from, from somewhere. So this final series last year in, in 2021, yeah. the storylines were so entertaining from Sandy coaching against Olaf and, and your friendship with Sandy. There was never a dull moment. Yeah, I would have hated to be in that house. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think at one point she was like, yeah, we're not. Well, they weren't even they weren't even spending time together during the finals. Hey, I wasn't getting into that. <laughs> she said she's like, yeah, we're not. We, we haven't seen each other. Like, yeah. We're seeing each other at the games, but that's yeah. it. They're good now. So. <laughs> they're, they're good now. They're coaching yeah. together in New York. But for you going into that series, um, was that an added level of excitement? Just being able to coach against someone you consider a friend? Do you guys not think about that kind of stuff at all? No, I mean, you have a respect and you have a respect for, um, and I have respect for that organization. Uh, I was fortunate enough to coach Diana, coach BG. And so I, I respect all of them. But uh, when it, you know, when it, when you get in between those lines, it's like, I didn't care who was in front of me. Right. I was just like, we're trying to win this thing. And <laughs> um, we'll hug afterwards, you know? Yeah. But, uh, I, I I, mean, I, I, they they have a certain level of my respect, but I respect myself and my craft so much. And uh, I respect our team so much that I was going to give 110% and uh, whoever we were playing. What was your favorite moment from the final series? Do you have one? A list? <laughs> Three, top three. <laughs> top three. Top one was the horn. The buzz are going off in game four. <laughs> well, okay, so, that, so that's an obvious question. But I guess if you had to pick something other than the confetti falling in the first ever championship happening, was there a game that? Oh, game during the game? Yeah. Oh, man. When, um, I guess game three, when we blew them out by 36, right? That's a record. That's yeah. a record. That yeah, was an entertaining that was a rec- one. Yeah, that was entertaining. And, you know, that was the first finals game since uh, 2014. And the the games, it left a bad taste in the fans of Chicago's mouth. Mm-hmm. So for us to let them know that we arrived and we're here, um, I thought it was amazing. I'll tell you one thing that like really like gave me goosebumps was the fact that we had like a, a packed house and the Bears and the Packers were playing across the way. Right. Like the, yeah. Like, I'm like, I, I was scared because I'm like, it's the Bears and the Packers. Right. I've heard about this ever since, like, we're not going to have <laughs> 10 people at the game. And everybody showed up and showed out. It was, like, amazing. The energy was amazing. So, no, nah, it was great. It was great. Game three and four really were special to see the sold out crowds. But, you know, you brought up BG and, and you're and – her your two relationship goes way back you coached her for three years in russia and it's been 77 days since she was wrongfully detained and this week the u.s state's department you know announced their reclassification as her being wrongfully detained and i wonder if you could share with us you know how this this announcement shifted the league's mentality from being mindfully private at the request of those close to her to to now being vocal and, and making sure that she's 
constantly brought up and and the priority of her getting home is is communicated so i mean i think you know i'm like everybody else like okay we want to we want to bring her up as much as possible but i i understand in the beginning when you talk about strategy and the the most important thing is even more than awareness is that she's safe and that we're doing the best thing to bring her home mm-hmm. um and so uh, from what I understood is some at some at certain junctions of this 77 days, um, it was about, hey, let's let's go about this a certain way. Mm-hmm. And so now it's a different tactic. And, and so we're going to do whatever we can to to bring her home. And the WBA is going to do whatever they can. And, um, you know, we have confidence that our government is going to do whatever they can to bring her home safely uh, sooner rather than later. Of course, we wish it was yesterday. Mm-hmm. Uh, we wish she wasn't ever detained. Uh, but uh, the you know just the person who she is is more than basketball at this point. Uh, she's a human being with a family uh, that really cares about her, and a WNBA family that really cares about her. And she's you know one of the faces of our league. And um, and I've coached her for three years. Uh, she's one of my son's uh, favorite people. Like she was there. At, at two of his birthday parties and you know he knows her very well and she brings some gifts and you know she's she's a big she's a gentle giant and so you know to 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 actually wrap your head around that she's in a place where she's being detained and uh she's not comfortable um that's that's uh heartbreaking and so um we're we're going to do whatever we can to support whoever we need to support to help get her home and we hope that um our society can understand that this is a a pressing issue that needs to be addressed and um, whatever we need to do, we have to do it. Absolutely. Um, You know, each team is, is honoring BG all season long. The league is honored, honoring BG all season long, but what do you have a specific plan in mind or, or what have you communicated with your team as far as just making sure she's top of mind for you guys, whether it's before games, after games, um, in practice, do you guys have anything special? Just I mean, we have uh, consistent discussions. I know uh, players and myself have reached out to her, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and, and have been able to contact her and, um, you know, well, we're just trying to support in whatever way we can. Um, we don't have our full team together, but we've I've I've had discussions with players separately on separate occasions. I had one the other night with with one of our players, and we've we've discussed ways that we can uh, help her out or help help you know bring awareness to 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 uh, to BG and her situation. Mm-hmm. And um, so we're we're still you know talking about it and brainstorming about it and trying to do whatever we can. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's not about Phoenix Mercury at this point. It's about the person. It's about the WNBA. uh, And it's about her, how she represents this league and has done so as a top level uh, citizen for so long. And we just want to support her. Absolutely. And when you say you've been able to communicate with her a little bit, what has that communication been like? Uh, We've written letters. So we've written letters to her and, and, you know, they've, they've, uh, uh, make sure that she's gotten those letters. So mm-hmm. we just make sure that uh, everybody's writing her and, and making sure she has stuff to read and stuff like that. So that's, try that's, to try to bring a little light to her and let her know that she's not forgotten about. That's that's beautiful and, and really important. And it's important what the league is doing as well, honoring her all season long and making sure that she's top of mind all season long, like you said. And, you know, transitioning here to a, a a different topic of conversation, but you brought up Chicago and, you know, the Packers and the Bears playing during yeah. the finals and that worry about... It was, this, actually, it was actually during the Connecticut series. So okay, so the, yeah, the yeah, semifinals. The semifinals yeah. But um, when you arrived in Chicago, what, what was your thoughts on the sports landscape you were walking into and the the job you had ahead of you of... of taking up space in this very saturated sports landscape that, you know, has has a lot of championships to its name. Well, I knew it was a basketball town. Uh-huh. I knew it was a sports town. And I knew that the Chicago people were blue collar and hardworking. And that's all they wanted to see on the floor. Right. Some Something that's, um, <laughs> you know, that kind of represented them. And, you know, that's all we wanted to give them. And, you know, it was, it's, it, and I, 
I didn't put any expectations, but I just felt like we were going to win. And that's what I sold to uh, Slew and Alley. <laughs> and Michael. <laughs> I was like, Michael, yeah, we're going to win. Don't worry. We're gonna win. But, yeah, you um, sold them on that years ago. Yeah, I did. The first meeting. Yeah. 2018. That's right. Max and Benny's. Max and Benny's. We're going to win. And, and that was it. And that it was, was like, it. how are you going to do it? Don't worry about it. Slew and Alley. So now since the championship, how has the energy shifted? Do you feel a shift here in Chicago and, and yeah. more acknowledgement for this guy? Yeah, I, I feel it. Like people know my face even with a mask on. It's pretty cool. Like, yeah, you're getting stopped yeah, at the grocery store. Yeah, I'm getting stopped at the grocery store, in the airport. You know, it's pretty awesome. You know, um, just being a part of the history of Chicago, um, such rich uh, cultural sports and um, they love you and they're going to love you hard and they're going to support you and they're going to support you hard. And uh, I'm here for it. So I think my personality matches this city. And, um, you know, I've grown a love for the city that's uh, that's unmatched. So I'm down with it. Yeah. Do you feel like a Chicagoan now? Yeah, I do. When did that happen? Because Chicago is, is tough to feel that like welcomed vibe in. I think after the bubble, uh -huh. when we came back to Chicago, uh -huh. people, I was so happy to be back. Um, because we spent so much time in Florida and it's funny like playing with Chicago on your chest, but being in Florida, it's mm -hmm. just not the same. <laughs> <laughs> and so once we got back, we were so happy to be back at home in our gym and our practice facility and representing the city. And and so as the time went on, I think at the beginning of the season in 2021, mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of fans that was allowed in the games. Right. So as more and more fans came in, you can really feel the energy of of, of the city just just come to life. So that was pretty awesome. You know, you said something yesterday to me at, at practice about being a lifer in the WNBA. Yeah. What is it about this league that makes you confidently committed to this league for life? Uh, so when I met my wife, um, she was trying to get into this league to play. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was a journey for the both of us to try to help her get into the league. Mm -hmm. And so when she got in it, we, uh, we, you know, it was like I got in it too. I was so appreciative, appreciative of, of that and just following her career and following the players in the league and knowing what it took and how hard it was. Uh, this, what's happening right now, players getting cut and not making it and going overseas and doing all this stuff. This has been happening for a long time, but because of, um, you know, the popularity of the league mm -hmm. is starting to take more and more, you know, people are starting to pay attention to right. it, that, oh, it's great players that are in the league. And so it's been a part of me since we've been, you know, since she's been grinding and playing in the league and she was able to play uh, for years in the league before uh, stopping. And uh, once I got an opportunity to coach, uh, you know, I, I just felt like I appreciated uh, Dan Hughes and the WNBA for uh, giving me uh, the ability to be myself and to express myself and to help players do what I what I what I wasn't attain what I, I wasn't able to do. And um and so, you know, for me, I just feel like it's home. I feel like this is the place um, that I get to be myself and get to be with people that are that are so unique and, and interesting and um, have a passion for the game that uh supersedes uh money. And it just, uh, it's all about the joy of the game and uh, how much they love it. So if you had to predict when fans will see expansion, whether it's on rosters or with new teams, what's your prediction? This is just a prediction. We're not holding you to it. 2072? <laughs> no, I'm just like, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Like, I don't know, maybe two, three years. If it's, you know, it's just me guesstimating, yeah. you know, uh, maybe something like that. Two, okay. Three years, I guess, you know, you, you hear like, it's a lot of pressure. Uh, I'm just waiting for, you know, Elon Musk to go on. Uh, <laughs> say I bought Twitter and now I'm buying, you know, a WBA team or something like that. He so. could, the whole league. <laughs> yeah. Jokes. But um, you spoke on media day a lot about this title defending season, because obviously that's the topic of conversation for everybody. You know, a team hasn't done it since the 2001, 2002 LA Sparks. 
and that's a long time. Right. So firstly, what yeah. is it about this league that makes it so hard to repeat? And I know you've said yeah. previously that is you it? haven't done it or, or this is your first time at an attempt, but- I don't know if it's harder than that. Okay, so at the end of the season, we'll have to ask you that question again? Yeah, that's when you ask me when, you know, but I don't know if it's hard, because it ain't me. Okay, we'll revisit that question at the end <laughs> of the year. We will. But um, more, you know, you talked about that knowledge of of what you guys went through last year maintaining yeah. the knowledge and the experience of what you went through last year and what it took to get there and and kind of forgetting about the champ the the desire to repeat almost right. can you explain that balance and how you you go about getting a team to understand that balance um i had like a good example for that earlier and i forgot on the way here <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's it's like, you know, um, you have food in your refrigerator, mm -hmm. you know, and <laughs> you're not defending it. You're going out and going grocery shopping again. Like what's in your refrigerator is in there. So uh -huh. you got to go out and go get groceries again. You're not thinking about, OK, what's in that was a bad that was a bad one. Hold on. I'm gonna, <laughs> oh, I'm you're Let me see. OK. Um, Dang, I had a, such a good one and I can't even think of this. You also said people like are looking at you like you've gone from the hunters to the hunted and you're like, no, we're still hunting. We're yeah, not we're always hunting. Like it's not like I'm we're never getting hunted. Um, that means you're content and you're just trying to protect what you have. Like that's behind us. We're trying to get more. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's that was a good one, I guess. Uh, but yeah, we're trying to get more mm -hmm. like I, I, I don't. Um, we're, we're not trying to protect the 2021 championship mm -hmm. because we're already 2021 champions. Um, we're trying to go get another one and it has nothing to do with the 2021 championship. Mm -hmm. So we're all at zero now. Yeah. A player who, who's made a significant difference on this team. I mean, they all have, but one specifically is. Candace Parker coming mm -hmm. home and that free agent signing wasn't just significant in Chicago, but in the league in general. Mm -hmm. Can you take us back to that conversation you had with her at dinner in Atlanta and, and how you sold her on on making that decision to jump from the team that drafted her to her hometown team? Yeah, I was like, I got you. <laughs> I got you. I got you. It was Don't just that simple. That. I got you. You don't got to tell us our <laughs> secrets, but or your secrets, but like maybe no, just a little bit. No, of how I think you got her I here. think the thing is, is that, and the same thing that was told to me, um, you want to be in a situation where you can be yourself. Yeah. And um, you want to trust that you can be, and you want to be around people who are going to allow that, and uh, people who are going to celebrate you, and so. That's what I tried to just tell her. Like, if you want to be yourself, if you want to be yourself, if you want to be celebrated, come to death row. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but I, nah, y'all got that one. Y'all got that one. A little sugar night. Um, no, I was like, you know, just if you want to be yourself, just, you know, come here. We'll, we'll help that. We'll help that. We feel like, you will compliment us and we can compliment you. Yeah. And um, no play, no better place to do it, but to do it at home. And um, it helped that we had so many people that had a relationship with her. Right. Uh, so many uh, people that coached her. Mm -hmm. Me, my, I mean, Tanya Olaf coached her and myself. I had a relationship with her. Uh, she, you know, we had a team that was enjoyable to watch, enjoyable to play with. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we just felt like she would be a perfect match. So it was me kind of like showing her how those pieces fit mm -hmm. with the napkins and the spoons and stuff on the table. Yeah. <laughs> perfect. And and it, you got it done again, leading to one of the most significant free agent we moves got, in, in the done. league. And this season, this team is different than last year's team. And something you said last year was that you're not out here looking for players that need to get up you know, 25 shots a game. You're looking for players that are going to play team basketball, that share the ball, that any night anyone can go off. And and adding me, Emma, you know, she's another player that can do that. And so what are we going to see from this team this year that that might surprise some folks that that maybe is a little bit different than what we saw from, from your team last year? Uh, what we're going to see? I don't know. 
Um, no expectations. Gonna, I, no, no, but I, I tell you what, we'll see that's different. We're going to yeah. see Emma. We're going to see Julie. <laughs> that's different. That's different. Um, you know, uh, I might grow an afro this year. Okay. I don't know. Something. I don't know. You can't give away the game yeah. plan. I got it. I got it. But tomorrow is the season opener. Yeah. Uh, LA Sparks. And, and everyone's been anticipating this matchup between Candace and her and her old team for, for a year now. I think Over people are really year. amped about it. We didn't play against, like, she didn't play against them last year. Right. So this is like, uh, yeah, this is going to be big. A big deal. I mean, and it's, it's the home opener. It's home opener. and After, uh, oh, Defending the title. That, how, did, how did that work out like that? Somebody knows what they're I doing. I don't know. I don't Somebody know. in marketing Works planning out. knows exactly what they're Works doing. Works out, right? Yeah. And uh, the fact that she's a champion, I think, helps it. Uh, you know, she's she's uh, she's done a lot for, for that franchise, for our franchise, and for the WNBA in general. Mm -hmm. And um, tonight is, I mean, tomorrow night is gonna be a great night to to kind of see all that that come together, mm -hmm. you know, to see our old team and our new team and uh, on a night where she's, you know, she's, the banner won't be raised, but it's gonna be some partying, I'm sure. You know? <laughs> and a kinda, celebration. Yeah, and be a celebration. So it's gonna be a whole bunch of things come together in her home city. So it's going to be cool, and I, she deserves that so much. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm just happy that I'm just a part of it. You know, mm -hmm. I'm a part of it, so it's pretty cool. You know, something about her return home that I feel like it's has been skipped over a little bit is is the pressure that comes with returning home after you've already won a championship. Now you're coming to a team that's never won one. The the storyline starts spinning immediately of like, okay, can Candice be bring them a championship and. I, I talked to Dwayne Wade for in an interview in the fall, and, and he talked about his return home and how it didn't go as planned. And people talk about LeBron's return home and, and what happened and what it meant. So that pressure that comes with a moment like that, a season like that, you know, can be a lot to the average person. I mean, yeah. listen, I, I'm not cut out for that type of pressure. So what can you say about how Candace handles pressure that's, that's just – you know, I mean, special. It's, it's amazing. Um, the fact that she was able to come into the league and win MVP and Rick of the Year in the same year, mm -hmm. uh, have a child, then come back, mm -hmm. be better. Right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, LA, known as a glamorous big market team, and she was able to carry that, that franchise on her back for years mm -hmm. um, and take them to a championship and win the championship. Um, she's done it all. Mm -hmm. uh, she's won at every level and every place that she's been. And so for her to do it here, uh, she just needed some help. Mm -hmm. And who better to help her than Van Der Quigs and Kai and Steph, and, you know, all these players. And mm -hmm. uh, so we were just trying to, you know, create some history and uh, create some magic and we were able to do that. Absolutely, you guys were able to do that. And you mentioned Ka and and everybody called last year's season a breakout season, but you all season long were like, you guys, this isn't a breakout season. She's been doing this. We knew she was going to do this. Like, can we all stop calling it a breakout season? So can you speak to the evolution of Ka's game and and the work that she's put in to, to have earned 2021 WNBA Finals MVP? So she, so like, she's just special. She's a special person. And uh, she always thinks about others and she just she just want to win. So she has a she has a motor and a willpower that's un, like undenied <laughs> and you guys could see it. And so her passion kind of feeds the crowd and the crowd feeds off her passion. and They give it back to her. And it's like this this combustible <laughs> energy uh, that's built in this talented package. And uh, she's going to back up everything that she says. Mm -hmm. And that's one player that you just don't bet against. Mm -hmm. So it's really special to like coach her and like going into that free agency period and in, uh, in 2020, um, like I, we just knew it was going to be that kind of season. Mm -hmm. And um, to show it 2021, she took another step. Right. And you just, she just is who she is. And soon it's going to be a distant memory. Uh, this is just who she's going to be every day. And this is who she is every day. And then she went overseas, won first year in EuroLeague, won MVP. Like, she's for real. She's for real, y'all. Have and we even seen all of what Kaz capable of? Nah, but you're going to see it. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to see it. You're going to see it. 
What feelings do you have the night before um, a season opener, a home opener, and specifically this one coming off a championship? Um, well, I might give me a hot dog. <laughs> and, uh, no, I mean, I feel good. I feel good. Um, I'm not really thinking about the championship as much. I'm happy for you guys because we did it for y'all. Like, so I'm happy for y'all. Uh, but I'm I'm just focused on 2022. When the banner mm -hmm. goes up, I'm you know I'm gonna celebrate it just like everybody else. And um, but now it's just my thing is like I have an addiction. So just let's do an intervention, you guys. <laughs> I have an addiction, and I'm addicted to winning. <laughs> and so, so uh, my name's James Wade. <laughs> and, Hi, James uh, Wade. <laughs> and um, so that's all I'm focused on. Like, I just want to win in 2022, mm -hmm. and um, we'll just go from there. So before we let you go, we have a few questions from our attendees today, and, cool. you know, they submitted them, and, and they're cool. actually pretty good questions. I don't even want to say their names because I don't want them to come for my job, but I'm we're going gonna to <laughs> give them their credit. Um, so Brian P. asked, have you rewatched game four of the 2021 finals? Have you done a film session of that game? <laughs> with your team i've, I've watched game four mm -hmm. uh i haven't done a uh video session with my team but i have done a video session with the coaches though and um it's it's all good feelings but you know i can be critical of things so yeah i was probably yeah i'm like we gotta do this better we gotta, yeah. yeah yeah okay so now i gotta ask you and candace i i think Courtney to Ali, everybody said game four was a microcosm of last year's season. And truly those that watched the entire season know exactly what that means. Like yeah. it really was. But again, in your own words, can you describe what you meant by by game four was a microcosm of the entire year? Because it was like we went up and then we went way down. Yeah. <laughs> and then we just came back growing like lions, you know. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's like it was and the game was so emotional. I think you can see the fans. And if you look at the video uh, after we win, you can mm -hmm. see my wife like <sighs> she was like crying. Like she was, she couldn't believe it because I think she was like all of the fans. Like the heart was just like, oh my gosh! Like we did not want to go back to Phoenix. And, mm -hmm. um, but I was pretty confident that we were going to win that game. Um, I don't know if the mic caught it, but I. When Z got her fifth foul, I pulled her out. I was like, okay, we're gonna win, but just make sure you, <laughs> you don't foul out. If you don't foul out, then we're gonna win. And so she went over to the bench, she came back in, and, but Steph started playing well. And like, it, it was it was good, but I, I never had any like doubt. We had gotten that far and we mm -hmm. had overcome like a seven game losing streak. We had overcome being 14 and 15 with a week to play. Um, we weren't going to be denied at this point. Mm -hmm. yeah. Kathy C wants to know, do you think the little wins are just as important as the big wins when it comes to equality? Yeah, I think they build. Mm -hmm. I think they build. I think the little wins, um, they show uh, what's possible and they give people hope mm -hmm. and they give people hope to keep fighting, you know? Uh, so every little win you have, um, you're going to have someone that's less discouraged and they're going to keep fighting and say, okay, um, just chopping, just chopping away. And I, I think we have to keep on doing that. Uh, we're getting to a place. And sometimes we're not, um, the people that fight for equality aren't as highly uh, publicized or put in the limelight, or they're not as highly uh, quoted as the people that are against it. Uh, but you continue to be that way, you'll see that we're, we're actually the ones that are in the minority. I mean, majority, sorry. Right, majority. right, right. Yeah. That are moving the needle. Yeah. Marquita Wiggins wants to know, um, CP3, Candace, Sloot, Quigley, Emma, Azrae, and Kalia are guaranteed starters on any other team. So who's yeah. coming off the bench? <laughs> Me. I'll be on the bench. <laughs> <laughs> that was you that asked that That's question. a great question. Uh, that's a good question. That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. Who you think? <laughs> well, I think something that you said to us, like the reporters, you were like, there's so many different lineups that yeah, that yeah. could work. Yeah. So I will we, we see more inconsistency when it comes to the starting five than we did last year? I don't know. I only got six players here. So this, <laughs> this is going to be an easy one tomorrow. Who's uh, the starting five tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow. Let me I'm get it out. Let This is a good one for you guys. Okay. So tomorrow it'll be Slew Dana. Yes. Yes. 
Yeah, yeah. Dana, Z, uh, Emma, and Candace. Yeah, so. And we got to see Dana. Well, sorry, I shouldn't say we. This is kind of hurtful. Some of us got to see Dana and Emma together in the preseason games, and they look good. They look good, right? And they also look good because Emma, that was my first time seeing her in a Sky uniform, obviously. And her, the way she even, you know, was was the leader out there without Slu playing, without Candace playing, without yeah. Allie playing. It yeah. was it was just clear. It was like, okay, James got another yeah. <laughs> another one of his players. Yeah, she looks she looks good in blue too, so she looks better in blue. Uh yeah. Tiffany Mims wants to know, um, what identity do you want for the bench given the leadership of Emma and the experience of Dana and Ruthie? Uh like so we have a selfless ball club. And so I just want them to come out and just play hard, uh, whoever's coming off our bench. And um, we're a team that loves, loves, loves uh, playing together. Doesn't mm-hmm. matter if we lose or win, we love playing together. They they take enjoyment from practice. So um, I think we want to put a accountability, just as much accountability on the bench as we do on the starters. So by the time that the game is played, you, you guys won't recognize who's starting tonight. Uh, because we're going to put that much accountability on everyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sam G wants to know what can they do um, to support the WNBA and women's sports better? Um, just, just, just watch and know the league. Right now, it's interesting for me. Um, I really appreciate the NCAA, and I feel that sometimes the NCAA is more publicized than the WNBA and the WNBA actually has the best players in the world, like in the world. And so some people take offense when some players from the NCAA don't make it, but it just goes to show you how great the the WNBA players are. And it doesn't take anything away from them. It's just, we're the best team in the world, the best teams in the world and the best players in the world. And I, I just think you have to support them and watch it and come to games and bring your family and bring your friends. And um, you'll see, you'll you'll appreciate it. You'll appreciate it. I was, I was just like everyone else. I was like just a fan. And and I just fell in love with the game, uh, being that close to it with my wife. And um, it's one of the, like I could never leave and go coach in another league or anything else. So um, no, I, I just think you have to really enjoy it for what it is. And when you hear people talk about, Lord of Rams or do this or do that. It's the purest form of basketball and it's the most beautiful thing with the most uh, unique people and wonderful people that you can ever come across. So um, I love I love coaching the players. I love the league. I love everything about it. He just sold me. What? Who is winning one-on-one between you and Ed Vige? <laughs> no one submitted this, but I just had to ask. Okay, will she, will she see this? I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, she, we're friends on social media, so. Oh, yeah? Maybe. Uh, she'll win. Okay. <laughs> happy wife, happy life. <laughs> Honestly, my money is on Advij. Yeah. Uh, um, Janice wants to know, what opponents are you most looking forward to face this year? Um, I think, uh, let, me, let me see, let me go. Atlanta, Connecticut, Seattle, Phoenix. Uh, New York. He's about to name the whole league. L.A., Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Uh, Who else we want to play against? Indiana. Uh Yeah, we want to play against Indiana. Dallas. What about Minnesota? I say the best for last. Minnesota. um, And I'm missing somebody else. I'm missing somebody else. Who else am I missing? Did you say Seattle? Yeah, I said Seattle. Did I miss someone? I'm, I'm now. I'm lost on who you all named. You said Atlanta, I said Atlanta Indiana, 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 Seattle, Seattle, Connecticut, LA, Connecticut, New York, New York, Las Vegas, Las Vegas. Yeah, I said everyone. Yeah, that's yeah. so. I'm looking like going forward back to through. playing all those teams. <laughs> every every last five, every last team. Daniel C asked, um, "Can you tell us about the coaches?" Dallas, you- yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dallas, yeah. right? You yeah. said Dallas, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, Daniel C. asked, can you tell us about the coaches you played for and coached with that deeply impacted you as a coach and a leader? And we kind of touched on this earlier. I should have included this one up earlier when we were talking about it, because I know you've got a lot of impactful people. Oh, yeah, I have a lot of impactful people. Coach Jackson, who I played for in high school, he really impacted me as as a person. He was very, like, disciplinary and coach and, you know, tough love and, you know, just wanted, wanted to make sure you didn't doubt yourself. 
Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I think, you know, he was probably the most impactful coach that I've played for. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Coach Scott Groninger, I played for him in college. And he was someone, too, that really, like, gave you confidence and believed in you no matter how of a knucklehead you were. You know, I was, <laughs> like, solid good. So uh, those were probably the two coaches that I played for that, that have probably impacted me the most. Um, the coach I've, you know, worked with, uh, Dan Hughes and Cheryl Reeve, you know, those are two that kind of, they were like different ends of the spectrum. In um, what way? Because Cheryl comes from Dan's, Dan's tree. I'm interested well, in what way. Cheryl, Cheryl is Cheryl. Like she's gonna, she has this uh, willpower that's very strong and um, she wants to win. And, you know, she has, she has the, she has her blueprint and that's the way, that's the way it is. But now she's going to want you to be yourself and let you like be yourself and give you the freedom to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you do it in this structure and you'll be successful. Dan is like the best humanitarian you can ever meet. And he's going to nurture you and try to build you up for success every step of the way. The last question goes to Mary Lou, Mary. my mom. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Right. I had to let everybody know it. she's my mom. I love it. Um, what is Coach Wade like on his hot dog? And what does Miss Annie like on hers? Oh, my gosh. Okay, so I like. Uh, yeah, have you had a sh- proper Chicago hot dog yet? I think I have. What I, I was on it? <laughs> today, I haven't had one today. Uh, relish, uh, onions, uh-huh. uh, mustard. Was there ketchup on it? No ketchup, no. Yeah, he knows. Just, just mustard, relish, and um, yeah, mustard, relish, and uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. What about tomato? No tomatoes. No, okay. I'm not one of those dudes. Okay. <laughs> I feel like there's also some like pepper that goes on it or something that's like a proper Chicago hot dog. There I don't is. know. We'll, okay. we'll, we got to ask But you don't the put experts. ketchup on your hot dogs, right? No. Yeah, no. Like, yeah, what's that? I just like mustard and onions on mine, mom. <laughs> James, tomorrow is the season opener. I mean, for you to give us your time the day before, the night before, I, I very much appreciate it. Well, and I play for, we play for you guys. So that's why like, we play for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you all for coming to our very first episode of Equal Play that we've done live here at the Wiener Circle. Again, this is like the most iconic location in Chicago, in my opinion. Six years ago, I was living in a studio not far from here, broke as hell, and I would walk by here and it just was like... The Wiener Circle, you loved it. And so to be all seen a podcast episode here with you, um, you know, six years later, it's like Amazing. you couldn't have told me this was going to happen. And I, I appreciate all of your time. I appreciate your time, Coach. And we will see you tomorrow, tomorrow at Wintrust. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Seriously, thank you. This is great. My-